Hello students. Yes, your Ranjana ma'am is back again. And I've got so many requests regarding an angel in disguise. So here I am. So it is for my ICSE students, an angel in disguise. Because uh, many of you told that you all need it for your exams. So how can I not provide you with the video which you all need? By the way, I find that most of my uh, viewers are the ones who have not subscribed to my channel. So if you view my channel and you like it, please do subscribe. Watch the video till the end and after that, do press the like button. I always tell the same thing because they inspire me. And now without wasting any more time, let's get to Angel in Disguise. By the way, thank you guys. I've got a lot of appreciation from you. What more do I need? Many of you have thanked me and you all have said that you all find me one of the best teachers so I'm quite flattered and I assure you I'll carry on, I'll go on helping you all with whatever help you need but I always tell you now I have my coaching also so I might not be very frequent at times because even I have my students appearing for their first terminal and the block test and all that. So I might not be very frequent but whenever I find the time I'll do it, don't worry. I'm there with you. This is my assurance. So yes, an angel in disguise. I do. Achha, let's first, I always say we'll read the box. Okay. In his story, an angel in disguise, T.S. Arthur describes the transformative and restorative power of selfless love. It relates the advent of Maggie a frail young orphan into the lives of wheelwright Joe Thompson and his vinegar-tempered wife, Jane, and the miraculous effect that the child's presence has on the woman's character and the happiness that she brings to her adopted family. So who is the main protagonist of this story? Maggie. She is an orphan girl, not only that she is disabled, and yet she becomes an angel for the childless couple, Joe, uh, Joe Thompson and his vinegar tempered. Remember in Merchant of Venice, we are told that nature has framed uh, two types of men. One of them, they laugh at anything and everything and other have vinegar aspect. They will not show their teeth in way of smile, even if nesters were the just be laughable. So she was like that. But well, she had her reasons. We can't blame her altogether. Anyway, now let's read the chapter. Idleness, vice and intemperance had done their miserable work and the dead mother lay cold and still amid her wretched children. She had fallen upon the threshold of her own door in a drunken fit and died in the presence of her frightened little ones. So can you imagine the scene? It must be a real horrible scene. Small, small children. They are in their house. And the house is also a house in name. It's a tumble down house. And in at the threshold of it, their mother comes drunk. And then she falls down and dies. So which were the three things responsible for her death? Idleness, vice and intemperance. They had done their miserable job. And as a result, what happened? That means they affected the baby so much or the woman so much that finally she came in a drunken stupor and fell down dead in front of her house or rather as she was about to enter the house at her threshold. Death touches the spring of our common humanity. This woman had been despised, scoffed at and angrily denounced by nearly every man, woman and child in the village. But 
now as the fact of her death was passed from lip to lip in subdued tones pity took the place of anger sorrow of denunciation so uh, which is a great leveler death here also when the person is alive maybe because of the bad habits of that person we might despise that person but when that very person dies we feel touched we feel kindness we feel sympathy so here it's the same for that woman or for her children so this woman had been despised many people hated scoffed at angrily denounced man they just had nothing to do with this woman man each and every member of the village man woman children they just ostracized her but now that she has died na and this news passes from one lip to the other you know that woman is dead and then they feel sorry for her poor woman and now what will happen to her children so pity took the place of anger and sorrow so they become pitiful and sorrowful neighbors went hastily to the old tumble down hut in which she had secured little more than a place of shelter from summer heats and winter cold so her house was a house in name it was a sort of tumble down hut only a little bit of shelter from the summer heat and the winter cold some with grave clothes for a decent interment of the body so they knew that she, they uh, the children wouldn't be afford, uh, wouldn't be able to um, buy grave clothes also they can't afford they are too poor and they are small also so that is why the villagers only brought the grave clothes and some food for the half starving children three in number of these john the oldest a boy of 12 was a stout lad quite a healthy lad able to earn his living with any farmer money any farmer would want to take him to his own household to work for him kate between 10 and 11 was bright active girl out of whom something clever might be made if in good hands if she falls in good hands she can be made to do wonderful things but poor little maggie the third one the youngest was hopelessly diseased how did it happen why two years ago before two years before a fall from a window had injured her spine and she had not been able to leave her bed since so she became bedridden on account of the fall spinal injury except when lifted in the arms of her mother so when her mother was alive she lifted this little girl uh, to take her to the washroom and all that the things that were needed so her mother held her in her arms so now they were worried what to do with the children the mother is gone what is to be done with the children that was the chief question now the dead mother would go and underground and she would be buried and be uh, forever beyond all care or concern of the villagers but the children must not be left to starve yeah they can't allow the children to starve na after considering the matter and talking it over with his wife farmer jones said that he would take john and do well by him now that his mother was out of the way so this gives you an idea that uh, farmer jo- uh, farmer jones had already his eyes on young john but his mother always came in the way john's mother always came in the way and maybe she said i won't allow my son to go and work in your farm but now that the mother is dead he can always take him in and mrs ellis who had been looking for a bound girl concluded that it would be charitable in her to make choice of kate even though she was too young to be of much use for several years so they try to volunteer and they try to show they are generous actually they are very cunning they know that these orphans na they have no other alternative but to go with them and they can in the name of giving them a home they would make them work only feed them and give them shelter most probably they are not going to give any money also because they know these people beggars can't be choosers they have no other option and they the 
villagers are trying to be too generous. If you are really generous, why don't you act generous with Maggie? They won't. They know that you can get productive work from John. You can get productive work from Katie. So that is why they are willingly coming to take them. I could do much better, I know, said Mrs. Ellis. But as no one seems inclined to take her, I must act from a sense of duty, expect to have trouble with the child, for she is an undisciplined thing, used to having her own way. So before anyone opts only, she comes and she takes, uh, she offers to take Katie. And she's telling, no, since no one is uh, willing to take her, I'm going to take her. As if she's doing a favor. But no one said, I'll take Maggie. Picking glances were cast on her wan and wasted form and thoughts were troubled on her account. They felt troubled. But see, even these villagers were poor. So they couldn't afford to be heroic and say, I'll take Maggie. They had their own children. And especially she won't be of any use like John or Katie. Mothers brought cast off garments and removed her soiled, ragged clothes. Dressed her in clean attire. This is the most they could do. The sad eyes and patient face of the little one touched many hearts. And even knocked at them for entrance. But none opened to take her in. Who wanted a bedridden child? When instead of getting anything from her, they would have to attend her always. So they thought this is not a good bargain. Take her to the poor house said a rough man of whom the question what's to be done with Maggie was asked. Nobody's going to be bothered with her. So go and take her to the house for the destitute or an orphanage. The poor house is a sad place for sick and helpless children, answered one. For your child or mine? Mani, those children who have parents, for them this place might be a horrible place, but not for Maggie. Why? said the other, lightly speaking, but for, but for this brat, it will prove a blessed change. She will be kept clean, have healthy food, and be doctored, which is more than can be said of her past condition. Yeah, when she was under the care of her mother, she didn't get her food in time. Healthy food, not at all. So she will get all these things which she didn't get when her mother was alive. So this will be better for her. For your child or my child, it is not a good place. But for her, this is the best. There was reason in that, but still it didn't satisfy. The day following the day of death was made the day of burial. So the next day, suppose today she has died. So the next day would be the day for burial. A few neighbors were at the miserable hovel, but none followed dead cart as it bore the unhonored remains to its pauper grave. So the unhonored remains of that woman was taken to the poor grave. No one followed her. They were in the house, but no one followed the cart. Farmer Jones, after the coffin was taken out, placed John in his wagon and drove away, satisfied that he had done his part. They are trying to show they are very generous. Oh, we are taking care of the children. But they have their own benefit in their minds. Jo uh, Farmer Jones knows that if I employ someone else, I will have to pay a higher wage. And for John, being an orphan, I can take him and make him uh, do all the work I want without any money. Mrs. Ellis spoke to Kate with a hurried air. Bid your sister goodbye and drew the tearful children apart ere scarcely their lips had touched in a sobbing farewell. So no one asked the children what they want. They don't whether they when I want to leave and go. The three children... The three siblings being separated from each other without their consent. Hastily, others went out, some glancing at Maggie and some resolutely refraining from a look until all had gone. So deliberately, they don't try to look at her because they know if we look at her, we'll feel sad. Her sad looks will make us weak. So it's better not to look at her. She was alone just beyond the threshold. Joe Thompson, the wheelwright, paused and said to the blacksmith's wife, who was hastening off with the rest, It's a cruel thing to leave her so, so poor Maggie who can't even get down from her bed and they are leaving her like that and all going away. So Joe Thompson couldn't bear it, so he's telling it's a cruel thing. Then take her to the poor house, she'll have to go there, answered the blacksmith's wife, springing away and leaving Joe behind. 
So she doesn't want to take any responsibility. So she leaves. For a little while, the man stood with a puzzled air, not knowing what to do. Then he turned back and went into the hovel again. So he enters that hovel again. Maggie, with painful effort, had raised herself to an upright position and was sitting on the bed, straining her eyes upon the door out of which all had just departed. So imagine the horror and fear in the heart of the girl. Her brother and sister taken away, poor child. Her mother dead and she is left and soon it will be dark. A vague terror had come into her thin white face. Oh, Mr. Thompson, she cried out, catching her suspended breath. Don't leave me here all alone. Though rough in exterior, Joe Thompson, the wheelwright, had a heart. So outwardly he might seem a tough person, but he was from inside a soft person. He had soft corner. And it was very tender in some places. He liked children and was pleased to have them come to his shop where sleds and wagons were made or mended for the village lads without a draft on their hoarded sixpences. That means when young children came to mend their sleds and wagons, he did it without taking any money from them. No, dear, he answered in a kind voice, going to the bed and stooping down over the child. You shan't be left al here alone. Then he wrapped her with a gentleness almost of a woman in the clean bedclothes which some neighbor had brought and lifting her in his strong arms, bore her out into the air and across the field that lay between the hovel and his home. So this is a good Samaritan. He can't leave her like that. So when everyone leaves her and goes, he comes and picks her up and walks towards his home. Though there is a shrewd wife waiting there, a vinegar-tempered wife. Now, Joe Thompson's wife, who had happened to be childless, was not a woman of saintly temper, nor much given to self-denial for others' good. And Joe had well-grounded doubts touching the manner of greeting he should receive on his arrival. So she was not really a very uh, gentle woman. Neither was she accustomed to deny herself of the goods in order to uh, in order to benefit someone and Joe had very strong doubts he knew very well what type of greeting he should be getting from his wife he knew it very well he had his doubts that she is not going to give me a nice oh what a nice thing you have done not that type of hearty welcome hmm. Mrs. Thompson saw him approaching from the window and with ruffling feathers met him, met him a few paces from the door as he opened the garden gate. So she's standing at the door and he has opened the garden gate, carrying Maggie inside and came in. He bore a precious burden, precious burden. What do we call this? Oxymoron, two opposites. Hmm? And he felt it to be so as his arms held a sick child to his breast a sphere of tenderness went out from her and penetrated his feelings. So there is as if a link, huh, the tenderness from her heart to his. A bond had already corded itself around both. Who are both? Joe Thompson and Maggie. A bond of love. Love was springing into life. What have you there? Sharply questioned Mrs. Thompson. Joe felt the child start and shrink against him, hearing the voice of Mrs. Thompson, poor little Maggie. She starts, she gets scared and she shrinks against Joe. He did not reply except by a look that was pleading and cautionary. Why pleading? Money? He's looking, with, looking at her, imploring her, please and cautionary, don't frighten the child. Wait a moment for explanations and be gentle. Why he doesn't want Maggie to be more frightened? She's already frightened out of her wits. And passing in, carried Maggie to the small chamber on the first floor, laid her on a bed. Then stepping back, he shut the door and stood face to face with his vinegar-tempered wife in the passage outside. 
so he takes her he goes very carefully he puts her in the chamber closes the door so that maggie doesn't hear any of their altercation and then comes to face his vinegar tempered wife you haven't brought home that sick brat anger and astonishment were in the tones of mrs jo thompson her face was in a flame she was angry i think women's hearts are sometimes very hard said jo usually jo thompson got out of his wife's way or kept rigidly silent and non combative when she fired up on any subject see in normal times na he would not answer her back why she was of a very furious temper so he preferred to keep out of her way he didn't prefer to answer her back and all that that was his normal custom but today he answers her back so naturally she is surprised it was with some surprise therefore that she now encountered a firmly set countenance and a resolute pair of eyes whose eyes joe's eyes what type her determination or resolution in his eyes and his face firmly set this is not the joe thompson she knows women's heart are not so hard as men. half are not half so hard as men jo saw by a quick intuition that his resolute bearing had impressed his wife and he answered quickly and with real indignation real anger be that as it may he every woman at the funeral turned her eyes steadily from the sick child's face and when the cart went off with her dead mother hurried away and left her alone in that old hut the sun not an hour in the sky mane within an hour the sun would set and they left her in that condition and went as fast as they could so women's heart how can you say they are not half as hard as men they have proved that their hearts can be very hard where were john and kate asked mrs thompson farmer jones tossed john into his wagon and drove off Katy went home with Mrs. Ellis, but nobody wanted to, the poor sick one. Send her to the poor house was the cry. So he is narrating to her what happened there. Why didn't you let her go then? Why did you bring her here for? What did you bring her here for? So she feels yes. When everybody suggested that, why didn't you allow that to happen? Why did you bring her? She can't walk to the poor house, said Joe. Somebody's arms must carry her. and mine are strong enough for that task i brought her home because she has to be taken she can't walk on her own uh, she is uh, handicapped so someone has to carry her and my arms are strong enough that is why i have brought her home then why didn't you keep on why did you stop here so you could have taken and dumped her in the orphanage why did you bring her here because i am not apt to go on fools errands the guardians must first be seen and a permit obtained yeah i am not a foolish person to go and uh, dump her money go to dump her there because there are some formalities that are to be observed money i have to first go and meet the guardians of the poor house and only when they give me permission then only i'll have to fill forms and all that and then only i can take her and put her there when will you see the guardians was asked with ill irre- a uh, pressable impatience tomorrow why put it off till tomorrow go at once for the permit and get the whole thing off your hands to night jane said the wheel right with an impressiveness of tone that greatly subdued his wife i read in the bible sometimes and find much said about little children how the savior savior here refers to jesus christ rebuke the disciples who would not receive them so he brings in the reference of the bible to subdue his angry wife and it works like a miracle how he took them up in his arms and blessed them so jesus christ took children in his arms and blessed them and how he said that whosoever gave them even a cup of cold water should not go unrewarded so he reminds of what jesus christ had said that whosoever does a little bit of favor to a little child will always be rewarded now it is a small thing for us to keep this poor motherless little one for one single night to be kind to her for one single night to make her life comfortable for one single night so can't we be good to her for one single night the voice of the strong rough man shook when he becomes emotional and he turned his head away 
so that the moisture in his eyes might not be seen. That means his eyes get filled with tears. He becomes so emotional. Mrs. Thompson did not answer, but the soft feeling crept into her heart. So uh, Joe's very emotional words make an effect on even Mrs. Thompson. Look at her kindly, Jane. Speak to her kindly, said Joe. Think of her dead mother and the loneliness, the pain, the sorrow that must be on all her coming life. Money, think of her as a very unlucky child, poor child. The softness of his heart gave unwanted eloquence to his lips. The softness in his heart made him very eloquent. He spoke very well. Mrs. Thompson did not reply, but presently turned towards the little chamber where her husband had deposited Maggie and pushing open the door, went quietly in. Now Joe realizes, I have done my work. Joe did not follow. He saw her stake had changed and felt it would be best to leave her alone with the child. Let their relation work out. Let's see if it works out or not. So he went to his shop which stood near the house and worked until dusky evening released him from labor. A light shining through the little chamber windows was the first object that attracted Joe's attention on turning towards the house. It was a good omen, what? The light in the chamber. The path led him by these windows and when opposite, he could not help pausing to look. So there was a window through which he could have a look at the chamber and he paused to look in. It was now dark enough outside to screen him from observation. Maggie lay a little raised on the pillow with a lamp shining full upon her face. Mrs. Thompson was sitting by the bed talking to the child. A good sign. She is interacting with the child. But her back was towards the window, so Joe could not see her expressions. But looking at the expression on Maggie's face, he could understand that whatever it was, it was not harsh or cruel things that Mrs. Thompson was telling her wife. Otherwise, there would have been a hurt feeling in Maggie's face, but it was not there. Uh, but her back was towards the window, so that her countenance means face was not seen. From Maggie's face, therefore, Joe must read the character of their intercourse, means what talk is going on between them. He saw that her eyes were intently fixed upon his wife, whose eyes? Maggie's eyes. And now and then a few words came as if in answer from her lips that her expression was sad and tender. But he saw nothing of bitterness and pain. That means the words of Mrs. Joe Thompson are nothing... Uh, are not such that they are giving her any bitterness or pain. That means she is not being cruel to her. A deep drawn breath, a sigh of relief, was followed by one of relief as a weight lifted itself from his heart. Finally, it is working, he thinks so. On entering, Joe did not go immediately to the little chamber. He's very clever. He's trying to be indifferent. His heavy tread about the kitchen, his heavy tread means heavy footsteps about the kitchen, brought his wife somewhat hurriedly from the room where she had been with Maggie. So she comes rushing from the chamber, hearing the footsteps of her husband. Joe thought it best not to refer to the child, nor to manifest any concern in regard to her. How soon will supper be ready? Right soon, answered Mrs. Thompson, beginning to bustle about. Yeah, she's being busy. There was no asperity in her voice. After washing from his hands and face the dust and soil of work, Joe left the kitchen and went to the little bedroom. A pair of uh, large bright eyes looked up at him from the snowy bed. That means everything was white, the bed sheet, the pillow covers, and looked at him tenderly, gratefully, pleadingly. How his heart swelled in his bosom. He feels so happy. And especially he's a child, he doesn't have any chi uh, child. So childless couple they are. With what a quicker motion came the heartbeats. Joe sat down and now for the first time examining the thin frame carefully under the lamplight, saw that it was an attractive face and full of a childish sweetness which suffering had not been able to obliterate. 
Your name is Maggie, he said, as he sat down and took his her soft little hand in his. Yes, sir. Her voice struck a chord that quivered in a low strain of music. So, quite a musical voice. Have you been sick long? Yes, sir. What a sweet patience was in her voice. Has the doctor been to see you? He used to come. Has he? Uh, he used to come, but not lately? No, sir. Have you any pain? Sometimes, but not now. When had you pain? This morning, my side ached and my back hurt when you carried me. It hurts you to be lifted or moved about? Yes, sir. Your side doesn't take now? No, sir. Does it take a great deal? Yes, sir, but it hasn't ached any since I have been on this soft bed. The soft bed feels good? Oh, yes, sir, so good. What a satisfaction mingled with gratitude was in her voice. Supper is ready, said Mrs. Thompson, looking into the room a little while afterwards. Joe glanced from his wife's face to that of Maggie. She understood him and answered, Money, he's glancing at his wife's face means, what about her? You are calling me, but when will she eat? What about her? She can wait until we are done and then I will bring her something to eat. So Mrs. Joe is also trying to be indifferent. Oh, let's have our dinner first and then I'll bring her something to eat. There was an effort at indifference on the part of Mrs. Thompson. But her husband had seen her through the window and understood. So Joe Thompson had seen his wife through the window. And now when she is trying to be cold, he knows this is not real coldness. She is deliberately pretending to be cold because he had already seen her through the window. The interaction she was having with Maggie. And uh, Joe waited after sitting down to the table for his wife to introduce the subject uppermost in both their thoughts. In their, both their thoughts, the topic of Maggie, what is to be done with her, was in the uppermost level of their thoughts. But both of them are waiting for the other to broach it. But she kept silent on the theme for many minutes and he maintained a light reserve. Both of them are wanting the other to speak out. At last she said abruptly, what are you going to do with that child? I thought you understood me that she was to go to the poor house, replied Joe, as if surprised at her question. Mrs. Thompson looked rather strangely at her husband for some moments and then dropped her eyes. She doesn't want her to go. Now, a change has come over her. And she's feeling, what? This man wants to send her to the workhouse. Uh, poor house. The subject was not again referred to during the meal. At its close, Mrs. Thompson toasted a slice of bread and softened it with milk and butter. Adding to this a cup of tea, she took them in to Maggie and held the small waiter on which she had placed them while the hungry waiter ate with every sign of pleasure. So she must be enjoying the food for maybe God knows. I think uh, she, uh, this is for after a long time she is having some good food because her mother, they were half starved children. You can't expect her mother to feed these type of things. She hardly worked idleness. Mm. Is it good? Asked Mrs. Thompson, seeing with what a keen relish the food was taken. The child paused with the cup in her hand and answered with a look of gratitude that awoke to new life old human feelings which had been slumbering in her heart for a score of, for half a score of years, for the last 10 years. She had wanted a child of her own and she was deprived of it. So all these kind feelings had been um, sleeping, dormant, inactive in her heart. And now they are erupting, coming out. We'll keep her a day or two longer. She's so weak and helpless, said Mrs. Thompson 
in answer to her husband's remark at breakfast time on the next morning. Next morning, Joe Thompson says, what is to be done? I think I should go and talk to the guardians. Actually, he also doesn't want. He's testing his wife. He knows she has also changed and neither does he want to drop her to the poor house. But deliberately, he wants to get the answer from his wife. So she says, no, no, she's so weak. Now we'll keep her for a day or two and then hmm, that he must step down and see the guardians uh, of the poor about Maggie. So Joe suggested that I should go and see the guardians. So she says, no, 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 not now. She's too weak. She'll be so much in your way, said Joe. Oh, she'll be a burden to you, na? You have a lot of work to do and then she will be in your way. I shan't mind that for a day or two. Poor thing. Joe, Joe did not see the guardians of the poor on that day, on the next, nor on the day following. So he doesn't go only. Why? In fact, he never saw them at all on Maggie's account. For in less than a week, Mrs. Joe Thompson would as soon leave thought of taking up her own abode in the almshouse as sending Maggie there. So within a week, Mrs. Thompson had got so attached to Maggie that this suggestion that go and put her in the workhouse. So Mrs. Thompson would pack her own bag and baggage and start living there with Maggie. So she has become too attached to Maggie. And this child is like an angel in disguise. What light and blessing did that silk and helpless child bring to the home of Joe Thompson? To the others, she might be of no value, useless. But for them who were craving for a child, she is really a precious burden. So they are too happy to have her. It had been dark and cold and miserable there for a long time just because his wife had nothing to love and care for out of herself. And so became sore, irritable, ill-tempered and self-afflicting in the desolation of her woman's nature. His wife had abandoned her woman's nature and become ill-tempered and irritable and sore. Why? Because she was deprived of motherhood. She was deprived of a child. She could not become a mother. And now... The sweetness of that sick child looking ever to her in love, patience and gratitude was as honey to her soul and she carried her in her heart as well as her arms. She just doesn't carry the child in her arms. She carries the child in her heart also. A precious burden. As for Joe Thompson, there was not a man in all the neighborhood who drank daily of a more precious wine of life than he. So, this wine is not the wine which people drink in the pub. This is a precious wine. This is a different wine. An angel had come into his house, disguised as a sick, helpless and miserable child and filled all its dreary chambers with the sunshine of love. So, uh, to different people, the same thing might Affect in a different way. To the other people of the village who had children of their own, Maggie was a burden. But to this childless couple, Maggie was not so. Maggie was uh, like sunshine in their lives. Maggie was as if a fountain of love in their lives. She was an angel in disguise. And she angels can come in any form. And how did she come? In the form of a sick, helpless and miserable child. So what a wonderful story, isn't it? I love the story. Now what are the things you should pay attention to while preparing uh, this chapter for your exams? Uh, just wait a bit. The title, obviously, uh, you will be given, uh, you might be given, I can't say you will be given, you might be given a question, uh, justify the title or how apt is the title in Angel in Disguise. So you will have to 
write about it yes of course it's a very appropriate title why you will have to describe that the story revolves around the main protagonist maggie she is a diseased disabled child but how she brings happiness in the life of the childless couple and she becomes an angel for them and not only that what else the theme theme there are uh, two one is love as redeemer why because see uh, mrs thompson had become hard hearted why because she had been deprived of a child but when maggie came into in their lives that love comes back to her huh? that love which she wanted to shower on her child she showers it on this destitute child hmm. and selfishness versus selflessness hmm. is one of the main themes just see farmer jones and mrs ellis they are selfish hmm. the mother of the three children john kate and maggie dies so farmer jones and mrs ellis they take these two why because they are profitable hmm. and nobody in the village wants to take maggie why because she is invalid one of the villagers also suggests that she should be taken to the workhouse hmm. but out of sympathy joe thompson takes maggie along with him so selfishness versus selflessness what are the other things you have to prepare so i said theme i said title now irony very important so he has used irony to justify the title of the story hmm. of the three yes sorry uh, the title is angel in disguise to the other she is a sick invalid diseased child but to uh, joe thompson and his wife she is an angel in disguise why because um, joe, uh, joe thompson and jane both grow very fond of maggie they find a new meaning to their life and mrs thompson who was ill tempered selfish changes into a loving and affectionate mother so maggie who was regarded by everybody in the village as an invalid a useless burden she became an angel in disguise for these people and there are metaphor huh? personification oxymoron oxymoron i always said two opposites and repetition so style you have to go through all these and there is also onomatopoeia that means a sound word so the author has used onomatic onomatopoeic phrases such as beginning to bustle bustle is actually a sound word the story begins in a sad tone and finally it ends in a happy note so from pessimism to optimism mm. from sadness or melancholy death touches the or intemperance idleness and all that so it started in a very gloomy and sad way but ended in a very positive and happy manner so i hope you all have understood many of you had requested me so i hope you don't have any problems now so subscribe to my channel i am reminding you again and goodbye for the time being have a happy time till we meet again